Well, thank you all so much for joining us for this afternoon's program, a high, a, a high speed romp through the history of furniture in, in New England. We're gonna enjoy a fast paced introduction to the six major furniture styles that were popular in New England from the 17th century to the early decades of the 19th century. The lecture will also provide clues to identifying furniture in different styles and also suggest the changing influences, materials, and technology behind the furniture made over two centuries in New England. And today we're joined by Nancy Carlisle, who's the Senior Curator of Collections at Historic New England, where she has worked for more than 30 years. And she's also the author of the award-winning book, Cherished Possessions, A New England Legacy, and also the co-author of America's Kitchens. And we again thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring, uh, along with the Memorial Hall Library in Andover. Uh, so all 50 plus of us who are here live on Zoom and those that will watch uh, later on, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Nancy for joining us uh, this afternoon. And Nancy, you can take it away. Thanks so much. <laughs> Robert, thank you. Oh my goodness, what a lovely introduction. And uh, I'm hearing all your applause, uh, your visitors. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to do the impossible or try to do the impossible here, which is introduce you to six different furniture styles over about a 200 year period. Um, needless to say, um, I don't expect that those of you who uh, don't know much about furniture will come away being able to identify individual pieces. But what I hope you will know is that the study of furniture uh, is fascinating for providing an additional pathway to understanding things like local history, like um, technology, even things about national and international relations. So um, it's, it's amazing what, you know, just pinpointing an individual thing can spread out to the world at large. Now that said, um, these are the styles that we're gonna be talking about. Um, and I'm gonna start by saying that these are just this side of arbitrary. Um, it's not that the styles didn't exist and that they didn't change from one period to the next. What's arbitrary are the dates and the names. Um, for one thing, showing a list of styles with dates like this suggests that one stops and the next begins. But of course, that's not the way it worked then. It's not the way it works now. And people will continue to be interested in a particular style even as a new one is introduced. And then secondarily, the names of the styles, um, not quite arbitrary, but imposed much later, uh, looking back at what the styles were. So these are uh, a variety of names for the same styles. Um, interestingly, up until today, I have used this slide and kind of hung on to the traditional way that antique dealers and auction houses um, name styles. But I found myself just finally, um, I'm a little bit um, out of the, um, not au courant on this. I finally decided that I couldn't use Empire anymore for the only reason that really nobody's using that anymore. But the top uh, five style names are still in use, particularly in the market, not so much in art museums. Now this is a list, uh, two lists actually, um, of what a number of, what a couple of uh, furniture experts have suggested as ways in. How do, you, how do you analyze a piece of furniture that's in front of you? And as you can see uh, on the left is Charles Montgomery's 14 points. On the right, Philip Zay's 12 points. Um, and overall, these different um, things are things that we're going to look at as we go through and look at individual pieces of furniture. The ones that are highlighted are the same in both, uh, in both lists, but, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can slice a piece of furniture when you're looking at it, and um, these are the ways that two scholars have suggested. So to begin, um, we're going to start here with uh, a comparison that I'm very fond of. Um, these chests are roughly contemporary, probably both made right around 1700. 
Um, but what's interesting about them is that they reflect the fact that the English settlers who arrived in the New World in the 17th century arrived on the cusp of an economic and technological revolution. Um, and these two chests, both made in Massachusetts, feature the two extremes of technology. Uh, one looks back and the other forward. Now, you may want to guess which one is um, looking backward and which forward, but I'm going to tell you that it's the one on the left that features technology that was centuries old at the time it was made. That's this chest here. Whereas this really plainer chest, more um, uh, lacking in um, evident style, is much more forward looking. You can just barely see that there's a scratched design in the surface. And of course, these little ornamental legs. But basically, it's a fairly plain, what we call six board chest. But it, in fact, um, calls for capital, transportation networks, labor, and access to large markets, unlike the first one on the left, which could be made by a single man working with uh, locally available resources. So the furniture of the 17th century utilizes basically the same technique that's used for timber framing, for building a house, for building a structure. It's a technique that's been around for over 2000 years and it rests on mortise and tenon joints. So here's your tenon and here is a hole that receives the tenon, the mortise, um, and then pins to hold your tenon in place. And you can see it here in this um, blown apart image of a chest very similar to the one that we were just looking at. So a lot of mortises and tenons that you can see here and here, exactly the same way you would build a structure, a large structure. So instead of a furniture piece, if you imagine this is a rafter, and these as posts, you could imagine how a house would be built using the same technology. And you can see how these um, posts would come out of a single log. And the technique is seen here. This is a furniture expert, a 17th century furniture expert named Rob Terule. Um, and he is writhing, R-I-V-I-N, uh, a log, which is to say he's using these um, uh, chisels um, and, and hammering them uh, in an area on an oak log that's likely to split. And as it splits, it splits fairly straight. Um, oak is a really great wood for doing this kind of work. And once you have your riven pieces, you can then continue to split them until they're thinner and thinner, as Rob is doing here. Now, I showed you a um, joined piece of furniture, a joined chest that was fairly plain, but in fact, there was a great love of ornament in the 17th century that I think is largely forgotten. Um, and in this case, we're seeing a chest made in Plymouth uh, on the left and one made in Newbury on the right, both of them, but particularly Newbury, a lot of furniture survives from Newbury, Massachusetts. Um, and in fact, here we're seeing a chest that was made in Ipswich, not far from Newbury at my current hometown, I'm happy to report. This is made by a man named Thomas Dennis, uh, the home that he lived in still survives in Ipswich. And it was made around 1676. And I'm showing it to you uh, adjacent to a chest that was made in Devon, England. And in fact, it was made in the workshop where Thomas Dennis trained. So you could say that Thomas Dennis was an English joiner simply transported uh, to the New England shore. Now, as the 17th century um, moves forward in time, you start to see uh, urban furniture developing, uh, particularly, of course, in London. The chest on the right is a London chest. But the one on the left is made in Boston. Um, and what's interesting first about these is that this is the first time anywhere that there is such a thing as a chest of drawers. And drawers actually is a word that's been um, uh, translated from draw. So 
it's the ability to draw that towards you that uh, turned into the word drawer. Um, Let's back up for a second. And let me just say that these were um, particularly popular, um, as I said, in the third generation of settlement in New England, particularly in the Boston area. Um, they're fundamentally urban forms. They would have been very useful in a small urban environment, a small urban house, but also they would have been um, appropriate for people who were used to going back and forth between London and Boston. Now, in addition to the joiner, whose work we saw with the photo of Rob Terule, the other important furniture maker in this period is the turner. And here you see an engraving on the left of a turner working the lathe with a foot pedal. And as he presses down, the lathe turns towards him and he uses a chisel to cut away on a, on a rounded piece. Um, when he releases the lathe with, his pe with a pedal, it uh, the piece um, flips backwards. So it's a, it's a kind of rhythmic moving of the chisel as you're pressing down on the foot pedal and the kinds of things that you produce, particularly our chairs. So every element on this chair was turned on a lathe. And in fact, chair makers tended to be turners. Um, the person with the lathe eventually became the primary chair maker. But not all chairs had to be turned. The one on the uh, left is a very famous chair. It's the president's so-called president's chair at Harvard, where every president sits when they are um, brought in as president, new president. But the one on the left, on the right, was made by the same maker as that chest that we saw earlier, Thomas Dennis of Ipswich. And he was a joiner, not a turner. So he would have joined as he would a chest. You can see the pins here holding the mortises into the tenants, the tenants into the mortises. Um, and he would have hired a turner likely, or he may have turned these himself, but he would have been far more comfortable doing the joinery and the carving than he would the turning. A big step forward and an expensive step forward would have been uh, would have been um, upholstery in this period. And both of these chairs are showing their original upholstery. Seventeenth century furniture is highly, highly ornamental. And you can really see that with this piece. Um, and uh, we tend to not think of the 17th century as a period of great ornament because we tend to think of those uh, rooms as small and dark. But in fact, because they were small and dark, you would want bright furniture. Um, what we've seen has been toned down over the centuries. Um, but originally, imagine this as a much brighter contrast between light and dark. This was made in Newbury around 1680. Now, the style that is coming is the William and Mary style. And here you're going to start to see what we'll see as we move through all the styles is that oftentimes you get a switch flipped. You know, if heavy was important in the 17th century, then light is going to be important in the next century, including heavy colors versus light colors. So what we're seeing is this Newbury Court cupboard of 1680 placed next to a veneered high chest made in Boston around 1700 to 1720. Obviously this piece is lighter in color, but also notice how much lighter it is in weight. Um, these are called high chests. Um, it, the antique trade for years was calling them high boys. There's no evidence that that term was ever used in the 17th and 18th century, although the term low boy for dressing tables was used. So now we've got the combination of the turner making these frankly ridiculous legs. Um, and then the, the uh, cabinet maker who is no longer dependent on joinery to link together pieces of wood. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, I'm calling these legs frankly ridiculous because imagine putting a heavy chest on top of legs like this where 
you know, the thinnest area of the turning is probably less than an inch. And you can imagine what happened. They broke. Um, there are very few of these chests that survived with all of their legs still intact. Again, we've got this combination or this comparison where um, you'll see that the desire to raise up the functioning part of the chest isn't new, but the way that it's done is new. And that is <laughs> the new technology that sets this period apart from the centuries that went before. So earlier, when we talked about mortise and tenon technology, this is what we were talking about. And you see this drawer, which was made in the same way where it's pinned here. Dovetailing is an entirely new way of joining boards together. Um, and it required an entirely new way of life, believe it or not. Um, in fact, dovetailing required the work of specialists or the furniture made in this period is the work of specialists so that you have what we see in this photo are um, specialist veneer cutters who would have cut the veneers for a piece like this. But you also have to have specialists either saw mills or saw sawyers who are cutting boards that can be joined together with dovetails instead of mortises and tenons. So you're starting to see the need for these networks of economy, networks of transportation, networks of skilled workers working on particular things instead of an entire piece. And the difference is what you could see here, a piece made by a single person on the right um, versus a desk uh, made by uh, multiple people on the left. And that includes not only the veneer cutters, the cabinet maker, the turner, but even the brasses, which would have been imported in this period that are used for drawers. Whereas again, a single man could have made the poles along with everything else on the chest on the right. Moving on to chairs. Um, here we see two 17th century chairs. The one on the left shows this same interest in verticality that we saw with those veneered high chests. And it's the result of, again, more complicated shop practices involving the work of a carver, turner, joiner, tanner, upholsterer. It's lighter and it's more vertical than the chair on the right, which is more weighty and horizontal. Um, so the chair on the right is of that William and Mary style, whereas the one on the left is this new lighter style of the uh, William and Mary period. Caned chairs uh, become enormously popular in the William and Mary style. In part, believe it or not, they relate to the Great Fire of London of 1666, when a huge portion of London households were burned to the ground. And there was a uh, instant and um, immediate need for furnishings. And one of the ways to create a chair that is faster than the need for upholstery is by caning it. And so all around what is now St. Paul's Cathedral in London, that whole area became an area where caners and chair makers were working to produce furniture to replace that which was born. And that uh, effect felt its way over into the Boston New England area. Now, more modest than those cane chairs are the um, slat back chair, which also becomes prevalent in this pe period you still see that upward thrust, that um, verticality that was important in this style. And now we leap to our next style, which is the Queen Anne style. Um, and we've moved from the William and Mary period. And, and these names artificially relate to royalty in England, uh, which is the source for a lot of design that was felt or seen in New England. But You've got the caned chair of 1660 and later in uh, Boston versus a Queen Anne chair on the right. Um, and you'll see again, there's this big dramatic shift. We've moved away from the turning to curvy lines. It's a period that um, 
you might want to pay attention to, particularly if you're interested in collecting, um, because it's where, frankly, it's where the money is. The Queen Anne style has set records. In 1999, the chair on the left sold for close to $2 million. It's considered the best of the best. Um, there are other chairs made by the same maker in this same style, um, but they're not on the market. So this one was snapped up when it sold in 1999. Uh, even more rare is the stool. And this stool in this condition with its original upholstery sold in 2008 for more than $5 million. So again, Queen Anne style is worth paying attention to. The style, as I said already, is about curves. And the curves were um, really determined um, in part or, or recorded by Hogarth, uh, who created this print in 1753 called An Analysis of Beauty. And at the center of the style is the perfect curve. And Hogarth lays it out as the middle point of seven different possible curves. And the one in the middle is, according to Hogarth, the uh, perfect curve, neither too straight nor too narrow. And you can see how he's taken that curve and applied it to things like legs or the legs of chairs or women's corsets um, and uh, whether in fact any furniture maker ever saw that um, print is really not the point. The point is that there's this notion of beauty that suggests that it's based on a curve and it's based on a curve that is exactly right. Here are <coughs> two more examples. Um, both made in Boston, both typical of the style, uh, formed by these sort of sinuous groupings of S curves in the styles, you know, the styles, the splats, crest, legs, legs known as a cabriole leg, uh, which terminates in this case in pad feet and in this case in carved feet. The earliest reference to this style in America appears in 1732 in Boston in the account book of an upholsterer named Samuel Grant, who refers to six leather chairs, maple frame, horse bone round feet, and cushion seat. So the horse bone round feet is thought to um, really suggest this ankle. But in fact, while that is the first known written reference to it, 1732, it's almost certainly the case that the style was in Boston long before then. And you can see really much like we've already seen that even though this style um, post dates the joinery of the 17th century, it still relies on joinery, on mortise and tenon technology to hold pieces in place and the use of pins to enable things to move but still be held together without glue or nails. So a comparison of a Queen Anne high chest with a Boston high chest. I, I probably chose this particular high chest just to suggest how really wacky the style is. You know, just imagine the, um, the tension on these legs when this chest is full. And similarly to the trumpet turnings on a, on a uh, William and Mary chest, these are likely to break and often did. In the early part of the Queen Anne period, you had flat bonnet tops or flat tops like this, but that starts to change moving into the 18th century. And this is really a um, prize of um, Queen Anne furniture making in Boston. It's one of historic New England's chests. We know who it was made for and roughly when it was made. It was made for Josiah Quincy after he struck it rich uh, in the 1740s. Um, the decoration on the front is known as Japanning. And it was a type of decoration that was done by English trained artists done in imitation of the lacquer furniture that was coming out of the new trade with 
China in this period. And here we see a dressing table. Again, just a, a, it's a form that shouldn't exist, but does. And not only does it, but it survived for many centuries. But I wanted you to particularly compare this particular shape to the perfect number four curve of William Hogarth's analysis of beauty. Um, it could be too straight. It could be too um, curvy. What's curious is that Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, the primary furniture producers in the colonies in this period, all had a slightly different idea of what made for the perfect curve. And this would be the Cadillac of furniture um, in this period, although I once mentioned this as the Cadillac to a colleague of mine, curator at the MFA, and he said that even the term Cadillac is probably getting to be a little bit outdated, but Imagine this as the Mercedes of, um, of furniture making in this period. What's interesting about it is that this is absolutely a workpiece. This is a, a equivalent to today's computer. Before the days of file cabinets, this is how you file things away and knew where they were and kept like things together, which is a big concept in the mercantile world that is growing in the Boston area in this period. This is pretty early. We think this could be as early as 1715 to 1720, um, but it's very appropriate. Remember that Boston is a town where the wealthy are merchants. They are not aristocrats, they're merchants, they work. And this is a work piece that would support the work that they did. Now, Here's a chair comparison to see the difference between Queen Anne and Chippendale, which is the style that we're about to move into. And as you can see, the difference is there. Um, it's fairly subtle compared to other differences between styles. We have that same curvaceous leg. We have very similar um, uh, turnings holding the legs together. Uh, the only difference here is really that the splat has been pierced. And instead of the um, leg turning into the crest, now we have this sort of outward expansion. So it's an opening up of the design, in, at least in chairs. The style gets its name from a British cabinet maker named Thomas Chippendale, who produced the most famous um, cabinet making book from this period. He certainly didn't invent the style, but he published it and published different details, different designs, different ornament. And those details were very much codifying the style at its apex. Um, another who was doing the same thing but didn't get his name on the style is Thomas Johnson, whose mirror you see on the right, published in 1761. Chippendale's book was published in 1754. The question is, how do you translate that to furniture? And you can see here how it's done. It's done with enormously elaborate carving. This is a period when carvers were um, highly prized, highly successful, made a lot of money. Um, and now, looking back at it, we're able to identify their style and identify their work by their particular styles. The center, or I should say the place that went really overboard um, on the adaptation of this style was Philadelphia. Um, and you can see a trade card by Benjamin Randolph, a Philadelphia cabinet maker, that shows all of these loops and curves and curvaceous carvings in the things that he was offering to produce. Um, the high chest was not necessarily made by him, but it would have been the sort of things that he did make. Um, more ornamental, more over the top than what was appeal, what was um, preferred in Boston. And what's amazing when you start studying the difference between Boston style and New York and Philadelphia in this period is that Boston was always more restrained. And some would argue that it remains that way today in terms of style. Here we have a couple of Massachusetts made pieces, uh, both probably Salem. 
And you can see how you can add ornament to a basic chest of drawers. Instead of it being a rectangular, you can create this kind of swelled front or serpentine front or this curvaceous base. This is a Pompeii chest. This was probably the most expensive kind of chest that you could own. You can imagine that the expense is in the time uh, of the work it takes, but also in the waste. Um, these are made of mahogany, and in order to make this particular curve, you would have to take a board that was as wide as the entire piece and then carve away. So whenever there's a fair bit of waste involved, that's when you start to raise the expense. Similarly with this particular chest, and these, these are called block front chests of drawers. Um, and when they have shells on the top, as these do, shells here, they become the most valued uh, type of chest made in this period or among the most. And interestingly, these were particularly prized by uh, merchants as wedding presents. So we have examples in our collection that were made for the 1769 wedding of um, Josiah Quincy Jr. and his wife. Now again, looking at these two chairs, what we're seeing is um, this essentially Queen Anne form, which turns back into itself versus this sort of outward facing Chippendale style. And remember when we're looking at chairs, and I have to remind myself to do this all the time, although my colleagues are much better at it than I am, but basically one of the things you wanna look at is the negative space. And once you start looking at negative space, you start to be able to see comparisons between chairs more easily. Here we have a Boston chair on the left and a uh, Philadelphia chair on the right. And again, you can see the more ornate version of the same style shown in Philadelphia. At the heart of the style is what's now known as a cabriole leg. That shape of leg is called cabriole. And I just wanted you to see how it's done by a contemporary furniture maker. So you can see that the first step is to lay out the design using a template. And any furniture maker in the 18th century would have had bunches of templates for various size things that they needed. So a high chest leg would require a different template, for instance, than a chair leg. But you lay it out on the, um, on the block of wood and then carve away the parts that you're not gonna need. And then you get to work on the ball and cloth foot, which as you can see here has also been laid out um, in advance of carving. And here we've gone from uh, you know, slightly less carved to more and more, and you get the sense then of how you end up with a ball and cloth foot on a block of wood. The ball and cloth foot has become an indicator of where a piece was made. And for whatever reason, and I will tell you that I have talked to all my colleagues about this and nobody knows, um, for whatever reason, each urban area had its own style of ball and cloth feet. And you would think, well, sure, it would develop in one way in one town and one, another way in another town. But the fact is that cabinet makers move back and forth. So what I'm unclear about is why it was that a new cabinet maker coming into Boston wouldn't perhaps bring a New York style with him. But anyway, you can see here the Massachusetts style is known for this raked back claw, which you don't see in this Newport one. You see a claw that faces forward. In Newport, you have these carved through claws. So this would be empty space. And that's um, something that was found in Newport. We have a more flattened ball here in Philadelphia and more of a web between the toes. And then finally, um, this shows what they call sharp knuckles. I think of New York uh, claws as being arthritic. And you can see how this plays out here. Um, we have a Boston um, ball and claw foot here. Here's that Newport foot with the carved out or uh, carved claws and our um, kind of arthritic claws of New York and a flattened ball that's a little bit more webby than um, the others from Philadelphia. 
not that and 25 cents like it might not buy you a cup of coffee but it's just a, a little game that we like to play in our little furniture world identify the flaw and having done that now we can move on to our next style and here you get again that dramatic change between one style and the next whereas queen anne and chippendale are quite similar in many ways when you move into the federal style of the late 18th century, you start to see something that's um, almost intentionally different. So whereas curves are important in the Chippendale style, the curves are gone. Dark woods in the Chippendale style, now we have uh, veneers of light woods. And you also get this, what we think of as attenuation, this heightening of the style, this sort of longer, thinner leg, making the piece look taller, even when it isn't. The style really owes a lot of its uh, origins to the archeological work that was going on in Italy. Uh, in this period, we have the digs going on at Herculaneum in 1738 and Pompeii in 1748, from which, which prints are being sent back to England and make their way to America, showing uh, this lost generation, this lost civilization, and this very sophisticated design style that survived um, at Herculaneum and Pompeii. In England, probably the most famous proponent of the style was Robert Adam, an architect from Scotland um, who ended up doing a lot of work in London. Uh, and he visited the excavations in the 1750s and became a loud proponent for the style. The characteristics of the style are tall, light, airy, colorful and often using classical illusions like grotesques or like um, urns and vines. Here's a plate from the um, book by George Heppelwhite, uh, who wrote a guide to furniture that was published after his death. Uh, in fact, I don't know that we know of any furniture that was made by him but he's famous for the design book that survived him. Um, you can see again those kinds of that urn, those swags, uh, this light airiness of a uh, new style. In uh, Boston, um, you can see a couple of examples here. Um, a chair on both of them uh, are by Samuel McIntyre. And both of them are based on designs in Heppelwhite's design, design book. And we will move on. Um, on the left is a uh, design by William Fisk, a Boston based uh, furniture maker. A lot of his furniture survives versus the work of um, Thomas Seymour, also Boston, first Portland, before that England. Um, but doing a lot of work in Boston. And this has, again, a more um, straight allusion to the work of Robert Adam and the classical um, designs coming out of Herculaneum and Pompeii. I said that this was a period of the lightning of pieces, and I mean that literally. Um, these are two work tables. It's a new style, a new design, a new furniture form in this period. It was designed uh, to enable women to put their um, sewing away when someone came to visit in the parlor, but they're light and easily moved around. So if you moved around in your parlor following the sunlight so that you could see what you were doing, you would be able to move this piece with you and uh, return your sewing to it when visitors arrived. Uh, this is a beautiful, I will say, um, chest of drawers with looking glass or dressing table, also by Thomas Seymour, whose um, painted chair we just saw earlier. All of these designs really lead your eye upward. There's this, there's this moving up, this lightness, this verticality that's typical of the style. 
Portsmouth is famous for its examples of this style, particularly for the use of these very bright veneers. This is a chest of drawers from a historic New England's Rutland Bay house. Um, and it has the geometric arrangement of the veneers on the front of the chest, but these very bright um, veneers. And here we see the, um, the comparison. So on the left, you've got the lighter um, furniture of the federal style compared um, to the chest on the right. Um, and and uh, it's interesting to know what people tend to prefer um, because neither is wrong in this case, um, but for whatever reason, the money is in the Chippendale period um, in the terms of the collector's market. Although all of that is changing these days, but. This has come uh, late to the table of federal style. When I first started 30 years ago, there weren't a lot of people collecting federal furniture, at least not enthusiastically. And since then, they have started. It's fun to look at what's happening in other areas when you're looking at styles. And um, here we've got a perfect example of the period when the Chippendale style was popular, and that was a period when curves were popular. And then you have this more attenuated style of the late 18th, early 19th century. And I should say that these two paintings are uh, about 35 years uh, separated from each other. This is a French portrait by David, and it's 1788. And on the right is a portrait by Thomas Lawrence of 1825. So now we're gonna move on to the late neoclassical style. This is the style that until today, my slides said empire, um, but I've decided I have to move on with the rest of my colleagues who have stopped using that term. Um, but you get a sense here of, again, a, a shift away from what was popular in the federal period to something new and actually much more archeological, much more um, literal to the designs that were coming out of, of uh, archaeological sites. Whereas the earlier styles had a lot to do with English digs going on in Herculaneum and Pompeii, in this period we are suddenly influenced by Napoleon and his excursion to Egypt, which was done between 1798 and 1801, and Napoleon brought with him on this excursion 160 <clears throat> scholars and scientists. And it was their job to record what they saw as they were exploring Egypt in a way that it hadn't been thoroughly explored by Europeans um, before. Their job was to record both in the written word, but also in prints and in just drawings, which were sent back in huge books uh, following Napoleon's visit. And in England, this interest in the sort of authentic classicism was really amped up, as you can see from this painting by Adam, of Adam Buck and his family of 1813. And you could even see a very similar design in this Aaron Willard clock of 1817 that's in the collection of the MFA. And here designers are looking to new classical sources and especially French sources, no longer the English sources of the earlier style, but not surprisingly given the connection to Napoleon. Chairs of this period are clearly inspired by bas-relief classical carving, as you can see in this Baltimore chair of 1815. Another principal proponent of this style is Duncan Fife. The MFA, did, uh, not the MFA, the Met did a big exhibition on Duncan Fife Furniture of New York a few years ago. And the classical illusion is in the legs. Um, and on the left is what's thought of as a, um, you know, animalistic feet um, and a so-called klismos chair with the curves going in opposite directions. And here we see a classical design that's been called a curl you chair. 
Boston, again, as I said, always um, a little bit more restrained in design than um, New York and Philadelphia, with one very wonderful exception. And the exception was made for the visit of Lafayette in 1825 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his um, coming to the aid of the American Revolution as a young man. Um, he did a tour of America uh, in 1825, and wherever he went, all of the stops were out. Um, and this is a uh, couch that was commissioned by the city of Boston as one of the furnishings in an, in an apartment that they furnished for um, Lafayette in what they considered you know, the most over-the-top style. Now, coming from France, as Lafayette did, I'm sure that this looked very plebeian to him, but for a Bostonian, this was really as good as it gets. And I will say that um, this is an out of the ashes couch. Uh, it was not in great shape until it was discovered by two scholars working on this style and this cabinet making shop, the Vaux shop, about five years ago. That was the Vaux shop. Um, this is uh, their competitors, Emmons and Archibald. Um, and you can see that again, characteristically less flamboyant. Instead of having um, brasses or gilding, um, this is all, all the decoration here is in that beautiful figure of the wood. In New York, really at the top end of the market, you'd find furniture like this, where um, you get this wonderful cellaret, which is a wine case supported by gilded sphinxes on a platform above lion's paws. Um, and I think really you get the sense of the restraint that you find in Boston, because never in Boston would you see a piece like this. And it's not because of lack of money, it's simply the fact, and, and uh, People writing to uh, factors or writing to their uh, merchants about what they want uh, in Boston will always say, you know, not too much, not too over the top. And it's just curious that that is a trend that has lasted for a long, long time in Boston. So that is our high speed romp. Um, and again, we're just going to do a quick, quick review. Um, and here you see, again, the biggest, biggest shift occurred really in the third generation of settlement in New England from the medieval way of working to the new way of working to a way that uh, required the cooperation of different types of artisans, as well as an economy that would enable you to pay one person and then uh, charge another as well as the transportation networks that enabled you to bring things from, abroad, from uh, England or abroad or from the northern uh, forests down to Boston. And here we have um, the sort of uh, Queen Anne style um, versus this very over the top she says, as somebody who's been brought up in Boston for a long time, over the top um, uh, Philadelphia chair. And from the curvaceous and the uh, um, love of mahogany to the attenuated uh, upward thrust of the federal style and this interest in um, bright figured veneers. And then moving on from the early classical or federal period to the late classical. And here we've got a Baltimore sideboard on the right from about 1800 and a Pittsburgh sideboard, well, sideboard on the right, sorry, left um, was the Baltimore piece, Pittsburgh piece from a, probably about 1830. And again, I mean, you could just see what happens when you get tired of one style, you wanna look for something that kind of offsets or is just the opposite of that style. Now, let me just give you a hint of what we don't have time for. And that is um, the Victorian style, which has gotten an undeservedly bad rap um, and which in fact was a period, enormous creativity, enormous new technologies enabling enormously new kinds of work. Um, it's a really exciting period in the development of um, not only furniture, but dress, clothing, costumes, just amazing work being done in the second half of the 19th century 
and much understood. It still gets a bad rap when in fact it should be celebrated. And I will say that the Brooklyn Museum has a big show right now of, uh, of furniture from this period. So that said, um, we've done this very quick romp. Um, and uh, I, I uh, challenge you to go out and look at pieces and start to think not necessarily what style is this, but what am I seeing? Am I seeing something that is rounded, curved, carved? Am I seeing something that has applied decoration or is it decoration in the overall form? So Nancy, uh, let's take some questions and comments. Uh, Patricia says it's amazing that uh, today's furniture makers on HGTV are still using some of these same techniques. Uh, that was from Patricia. Elna says, so much of this furniture was just thrown out after normal wear and tear of family life. How many regret this now? Uh, Mary says, wonderful program. She'd love to see more programs like this. Uh, Vin says, this was very good and very interesting. Sally says, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, Mishing says, such a nice talk. All Thank right, you so, so let's much, get to some, all of you. We'll get to some questions here. Uh, Mary says, please tell me the name of the museum that has a Victorian furniture exhibit. Oh, yeah, the Brooklyn Museum. Spectacular. One of the um, Kimball and Cabots have been an undervalued New York maker of um, Victorian furniture. So get there soon because it may be closing soon, but I will say they put out a great catalog. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a show worth seeing. Eleanor asks, what were the names of the furniture makers from Newberry? <sighs> yep, They're, they had names, that's for sure. Um, and they are escaping me. The one name that comes to mind is a cabinet maker named Tickham, who uh, made what may well be the first piece of William and Mary furniture in America. Um, and he might have done it as an apprentice um, and he signed the back of it saying Robert Titcomb. Um, and, and I think he signed it pretty big, huge letters because he was so proud of the work that he'd done on this new form. So um, there, are, there are known workshops uh, in Newbury, um, a number of them, and they've been well studied and I'm just blanking on the names at the moment. No worries. Uh, Elna's, Elna noted that many of the chests that you showed uh, required keys, and she asked, did the uh, mercantile filing chest have a secret compartment for cash receipts? Oh, great question. Yes, it sure did. And all of these desks and bookcases have remarkable hidden spaces in them, and they have really smart, interesting ways of um, preventing you, for instance, of pulling out that, what we call, um, well, the, the central area of the pigeonholes, and you have to reach in and reach back and press your finger down on a release catch to pull that forward, and then there are drawers on the back that are hidden. So yeah, they all had um, a variety of hidden areas, in part for cash, um, and the feeling is, too, that um, if you were of that level, you had servants in the house and um, you might not have wanted to um, put uh, temptation in front of them. Uh, Pat asks, does the name William and Mary relate to the years in which they were the monarchs or is it specific to them? Both. That's another good question. Yeah, as you know, I mean, a lot of those names that we're talking about, Queen Anne, um, are English. But William and Mary um, are interesting because they were in exile in Holland um, until the uh, revolution that brought them back into uh, England. And while they were in Holland, there was a dialogue going on between the designers in London and the designers in Holland. Um, and the style really owes a lot of its style to what was happening in uh, Dutch cabinet making. So there's a, a combination in that case of William and Mary um, when they were um, regents, but also William and Mary and their connections to Holland. Uh, Gail asks, where is the best place to go in Boston or 
the suburbs to view different styles of furniture? Well, the MFA, of course, would be the place, the best place to go where you can see really great examples. Um, you know, one, well, one way to do it is to go to our great house museums. You'll see um, objects that are in, in many cases, the same houses in, for which they were made, which is amazing. So you can get that sense of change over time, both with uh, the Quincy house is a great example. There's about four generations of furniture in that house, um, but that's the house that they have been in for uh, hundreds of years. So both the MFA would be a good way to get a kind of survey of um, starting with the 17th century on the first floor and moving your way up. Uh, but then you can also th see things where they um, were originally made for in many of our houses. We've got great Portsmouth furniture in our two Portsmouth houses. Uh, Pat asks, one of the, one of the late neoclassical chairs had what looked like a yellow skirt. What was it? Let's see if we, oh, I bet I know which one that is. Is that this one? Um, yeah. Oh, there we go. It's this. So this is a Baltimore chair. So, you know, this chair is designed to impress. And um, in this period, this is just on the edge of the technological revolution that created um, loads and loads of textiles. Um, so we're starting to see the availability of the greater availability of textiles at this period. Um, and one way to show off your wealth would be to show off your ability to pay for textiles that had no use. Um, you know, this is, this is pure ornament and no function whatsoever. All right, let's see. Cheryl says, so last call for questions. We'll go for another five minutes or so. Cheryl says, interesting information. I still have my parents' furniture from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I know that the North Bennett Street School uh, has furniture making. Gail says, marvelous presentation, Nancy. I miss visiting all the historic New England properties that are open to the public. Patricia says, lots of great information. I'll probably watch again. Mary says, sorry, could you spell the name of the museum that has the Victorian exhibit? Oh yeah, Brooklyn, B-R-O-O-K-L-Y-N, Brooklyn. Um, the uh, Brooklyn. As in Brooklyn, museum. New York. Yeah, as in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, is there an equivalent or something similar in style in the US to the Regency era design in the UK? Yes. Um, what you're seeing right here on the right is pure Regency style. So this is what we've been calling late neoclassical. Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa notes, I've seen and heard New Englanders use the word draw for draw. Now I'm conscious of the way I pronounce things. Use the word draw for draw. Uh, now I understand they are using the 17th century term for draw. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Mishing says, I had a corner chair, not sure if, uh, not sure it's Queen Anne or Chippendale. Now I need to take a look. Uh, Sally says, do you know where Robert uh, Titcomb's chest is now? Is it in the collection of historic New England? It is on view at the Spencer Pierce Little House. It's and where's that located? Uh, in Newbury, appropriately right. enough, which is where Titcomb did his apprenticeship. Um, I will say that it's one of my favorite, favorite uh, acquisitions. Uh, we were very lucky to get it when it came up for auction a few years ago. Great. Uh, Elna says, thank you for your expertise. Marigold says, thank you as well. Uh, Sally, we answered that question. Uh, Kristen, very informative. Thank you. Teresa, thank you. Very interesting. Learned a lot. Well, why don't we wrap it there, Nancy? Do you have any last words for the group before we uh, end the call? I think I would just say, go forth and conquer. Look at your furniture, but also, you know, do come to see our furniture at Historic New England. You'll find that our guides are very knowledgeable and very interested in having discussions. Um, so we, we would love to see you this summer when we open our houses. All right, so in six weeks, we're gonna have Nancy's, Nancy's colleague, Kristen Weiss here for a virtual armchair travel tour of lots of uh, the New England uh, 
uh, New England history uh, sites, um, historic New England is what I'm trying to say, historic New England sites. Um, look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to this recording and a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please take 30 seconds and fill those out. Uh, let me know what you thought of today's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Thank you to the friends of the Tewksbury Library, uh, along with the Memorial Hall Library in Andover for partnering for today's program. And most of all, thank you to the audience for attending and Nancy, wonderful job as expected. So I'm sure this isn't the last time we see you, Nancy. Maybe the next time we see you, it'll actually be in person. Who knows? Oh, that'd be but, fun. It's my pleasure. And thank you all. All right. Thank you all. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.